In the name of Jesus, the one who makes us one, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Today we are in Colossians chapter 1, the second part of a four-part look at Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, as Paul and Timothy are inspired by the Holy Spirit to bring these words of life to us. And I tell you, every time that I open up the Word of God, it's amazing that not only was it something that God gave and inspired with great accuracy and authority in the first century, but it's testament and testimony to His authority and His provision and His Spirit that right here in the 21st century, these same words are just as applicable to us because they are the timeless, authoritative Word of God. And so not a human book, but the Spirit of God inspiring human authors to give us His Word, His authority, His, His Word, His voice, His living voice in our midst today in Colossians chapter 1. And so we're going to see a little bit of a big brush stroke. Do you know what I mean by a big brush stroke? Sometimes I am convicted that I use a big brush stroke when I look at people. And maybe you've been on the receiving end of a big brush stroke before. Maybe as a Christian you've been labeled as, well, all you Christians are just judgmental hypocrites. Big brush stroke. Or maybe you've heard what I've heard, all pastors and churches care about is money. Big brush stroke. I'm like, come on, folks. But they say it. Well, all of you Republicans are this way. All of you Democrats are this way. If you're not for this, then you're against this. If you're against this, that means you're not for this. And we do it when it comes to debates about gun control and abortion and the right to life or about genders and what marriage is and what marriage is not. And sometimes we go online and do these big brush strokes with our typing of comments and social media. And sometimes we're willing to say things online in the Nextdoor app or on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram that we wouldn't actually say to another person to their face. And so something about the 21st century says, well, it's okay to, to put that online. You know, I was thinking about Abraham Lincoln. I do that a lot. And Abraham Lincoln would say that he would oftentimes get angry and he would write a letter. But more often than not, an angry letter never made its way to the post office. But as he thought about what he wrote, he would end up throwing it into the fire. And I think there's a lot of times where I wish that I would have just thrown it into the fire. How about you? But we use this big brush stroke and we label people and we judge people and we alienate people and we say, well, I'm not like you, therefore I don't like you. And I'm not like you, and therefore I despise you. And if you aren't like me, then you must be a hater. And we use these big brush strokes. And then even on lighter things, like someone said to me on the way out of church this morning, you know there's a big brush stroke online, and it's called the Karen movement. And she said, as a Karen, I'm always labeled with a big brush stroke. And I said, you know, we need to reform that. Because I was always told that sharing is caring, and so therefore Sharon is Karen. Why can't Sharon get that attention, right? <laughs> All right, Sharon, big brush stroke at you too. But big brush strokes where we label and we judge and we sometimes don't think before we speak, not just with our mouths, but also with what we text with our thumbs or type with our fingers. And so God's Word calls us as those who have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God to lives of repentance and faith and to realize that there is only one person who has authority to use a large brushstroke that labels all people in one way. And that's the one who made us and who knows us. And that's God. And so there is a big brushstroke that God uses here through the pen of Paul in Colossians chapter 1 when he is speaking. And he uses the term you. So when Paul says you, as he does in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21, once you were alienated from God, he is not just saying just you, but he's saying you and me. We just had 10 kids and some adults come back from a youth gathering in Texas, and I remember meeting some Texans when I was in seminary, and 
The Texans are very proud of their country, aren't they? They're very proud of their country. They say it's one of the greatest nations on earth, the, the land of Texas. And, and, and they've taught me how Texans speak, that when they're talking to an individual, they would say you, but when it's two, it would be y'all, and when it's more than three, it's all y'all, right? So it's you, y'all, and all y'all. And so I think that a better translation for you into the English, if we are Texan, is to say, once all y'all were alienated from God. Because the speaker incorporates himself into the you. And so Paul is not just labeling others as being alienated from God. He also knows that that's his story too. That once you, all y'all, were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he, that is God, has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, to present you holy in his sight, Paul writes, without blemish and free from accusation. And so with this large brushstroke, God's word says all of us were enemies of God. Just as it says in Romans, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It tells us in other parts of the New Testament that we were born naked and blind and dumb and even dead in our sins. So spiritually helpless and without the power or the ability to save and rescue ourselves from condemnation. And so that is what we are born into when we are born into this world. We're born into a human nature that has been stumbling and fumbling and crumbling from the very fall of Adam and Eve. And ever since, we've been stumbling and crumbling and fumbling by our nature and by our own willful disobedience from God. And that turns us into enemies of the God who has created us. And yet, in His reconciling work, that is, His restoring of a relationship work, what does He do? He takes us who are His enemies, and He, with this even bigger brushstroke, says, in Christ you can be blemish-free. In Christ, you can be free of accusation. In Christ, you who once were enemies of God have been made his friends, but better than that, you've been made his family that find your home in him. So you who once were an enemy of God, big brushstroke, now have been made blemish-free in Christ, free from accusation. Do you see that freedom that you have in Jesus? that you don't look at yourself and I don't look at myself and you don't look at your neighbor and I don't look at, at my neighbor as being blemish-free and free from accusation. As a matter of fact, we spend a lot of hours and a lot of dollars trying to be as blemish-free as possible to hide our blemishes. And not only do we do that physically, but we do that spiritually as well, don't we? That we look at our lives and so in order to hide from God, which is what Adam and Eve did in the very beginning, God says, where were you, Adam? Where were you? And he says, well, I was hiding. I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was, I, was, I was naked and I was afraid. How'd you know you were naked? You see, it was sin that made him aware of the fact that he was naked. He was helpless. He was spiritually dead because of sin. He was an enemy of God. And yet God's reconciling work to humanity is to make enemies friends, and even better, to make them his family. How does he do it? In Christ. So when I look at myself, I see my sin. You look at yourself and see your sin. We try to hide it. And sometimes hiding our sins is, is the, what we do with the big brush stroke. Well, at least I'm not as bad as those people. At least I haven't committed that sin. And so we start pointing the finger at everyone else in order to cover up our own blemishes. And yet in Jesus Christ, God says you've been freed from accusation. That not that you are perfect, not that you are holy, not that you are without blemish, but in Christ Jesus, God looks at us and declares us righteous. He looks at us through the cross and resurrection of His Son and says, in Christ you're blemish-free. In Christ you're free from accusation. And right now in this world, you'll never escape your sin, but in the world that is to come when you will be fully cleansed and fully made blemish-free and fully be without accusation in heaven, on that day you will be seen 
as God sees you now in Christ. Once you were enemies, but now through Christ, He's reconciled you. A big brushstroke of forgiveness. And He has made you blemish-free in His sight. That is the gospel that we have been called to receive and then to share. And so point number two of four points that I want to drive home today is that, that Christ Jesus holds out hope for us as we hear and as we believe the good news, that is the gospel. So when Paul goes on to talk in Colossians chapter 1, he says, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now I rejoice that I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of His body, which is the church. So the church being the called out ones of God. You and me who have been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. We are the body of Christ this side of eternity. That right now, Jesus in his physical glorified body is living and reigning at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He is the sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords. And yet in this world, right here and now before heaven, the only flesh and body that people will see is the Jesus in you and the Jesus in me. We are the body of Christ on earth. So I was recently told that there are 60 Christian churches in Greenwood. 60. That's amazing. Assemblies of called out believers who with all their flaws and imperfections like us have been called to receive the forgiveness of Jesus, to lift our voices of praise to Him, and then proclaim Him in our community. 60 different assemblies, some small, some huge, others like us that are somewhere in the middle. And yet, we have been called to be the church, the body of Christ. Now, sometimes with a big brushstroke, people say, well, look at you Christians. I don't believe in organized religion. And as I told you before, then find a disorganized church and make yourself at home there. Some people say, I don't want to be like Christians. You all are a bunch of hypocrites. We say, yes, what I want to do, I don't do. What I do, I don't want to do. Romans chapter 7, come with me as we find mercy in the cross of Jesus. Because this is not to be a country club for saints. This is to be a hospital for sinners. And God says with a big brush stroke, everyone needs that hospital. We need to be the church, the body of Christ, and to hold out the good news of Jesus to the world that he died to save. So think about what Paul's saying. He's saying that in the gospel, that is good news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, you and I have believed that, We've received Christ as our Savior, and then having received Christ as our Savior, we want to make Him known to other people. And so if I want to make Jesus Christ known to people, especially those who have yet to believe the good news, will my words and actions do more to lead them towards Christ or do more to lead them away from Christ? And so if I'm thinking about how I'm talking in a mixed company of believers and unbelievers? Will my words make an impact for them for the good or for the bad? Will that lead them away from God or towards God? When I type something on a social media post, will it glorify God or will it take the attention off Him and put it on me? Will I say something to my neighbor in a written or electronic form that I would never say to them face to face, that maybe I need to think it, confess it, repent of it, and not type it. How many times do we in our actions give witness to Christ Jesus? Well, if we are marked as members of His body, the church, everything that we do, everything that we say is to give glory to Him and to be a blessing to our neighbor. So how can we proclaim the good news? I believe that in our culture today, one of the things that we can do is to remember Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those people who shine a lot more light instead of giving a whole lot more heat. Blessed are those who in a time of crisis and contention 
can have that steadiness and peacefulness and love in their lives. Blessed are those who, who don't go with the big brushstroke of judgmentalism, but instead a big brushstroke of grace and favor. Not to say I agree with your decisions or your lifestyle choices, but I'm still going to love you. Even when I don't like your choices, I'm still going to love you because Christ Jesus has loved me. I must love you as well. So the gospel does that. The good news does that. It holds out that hope, that confidence for us. And that confidence leads us into the future where God comes alongside of us and calls us to be with him in mission. And so Paul is going to be commissioned, he says, for ministry. Verses 25 and following, Paul says, I have become its servant, the church's servant, the gospel's servant, by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, the glorious riches of this mystery. And this mystery, what is it? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You ever seen that bumper sticker that says, if God is your co-pilot, you better switch seats? It's so true, isn't it? God doesn't just come alongside of us and be our cheerleader and be our co-pilot, but instead He comes alongside of us through His Holy Spirit and He says, let me take the wheel. Let me take the controls. I am the one who's in charge of this. You come along with me. I'm going to co-mission you. And so a mission to which we have been called to cooperate in the Holy Spirit is the gospel to the world. So remember when Jesus was about to enter into glory with the Father, before he ascended into heaven, he commissioned his church. And in Matthew 28, it tells us that his disciples are there. With all of their flaws, with all of their insecurities, some of them were still struggling with doubts, and yet they worshiped him, and then he spoke to him, to them. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He commissions us to extend the mystery of God and the mysteries of baptism where people are claimed as God's own. We're through the forgiving washing with water through the Word. God takes those who are enemies and makes them His friends, and even better, makes them His family. And that God commissions us when He comes to us in His body and blood today as Jesus fills us with His presence that, that enables us to go out and, and be His ambassadors and His spokespeople and His peacemakers in this world. He commissions His church, and He gives to us Christ, who is in us the hope of glory. So I was talking with the leaders of our church about two years after I was called here in 07, and I said, well, someday maybe God will inspire us to plant a church, and I hope we would consider this for its name from Colossians chapter 1, Hope of Glory Lutheran Church. And maybe we could plant it in Bargersville or Hopewell or Trafalgar. Hope of Glory Lutheran Church, shining the light of Christ in Johnson County, Indiana. And as shorthand, we would call it Hog Lutheran. Hope of Glory Lutheran for Johnson County. Think about it. Think about the endless potentials. There's the Hope of Glory Hog Roast every fall, you know? Uh, it would be amazing. Hog Lutheran Church. That'll sell. That'll sell. All you pastors care about is money, right? Big brush stroke. Well, yeah, okay, I care about the name. Would, would get some attention. That would be all right. But hope of glory. Can you just see it now? One of you will design a logo for that, which would be tremendous. But hope of glory says, my confidence is Christ in me, and the confidence I have for glory in the future is me with Christ at home in glory. 
Jesus commissions us to extend that invitation to more and more people to come and experience that hope of glory that is held out to us in the gospel. That gospel that takes us as enemies and makes us blemish free. That gospel that fills us with good news as we hear and believe. That gospel that commissions us to extend that to all people. And that gospel is the one that energizes us. It's the fuel for us that Christ Jesus energizes and empowers you for a life of faith and empowers us for a life of faithful ministry. Look again, and I want to wrap up with this. In verses 28 and 29, Paul says this. He says, Jesus Christ, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Energeo, energy. The Greek word energeo means to work in, to work within, to work inside. And so if Christ is working in us, then He wants to work through us, that He is your energy. Then when you are weak, you may be strong. When you call out to God, God, I need your energy for my daily life. I need your strength in my weakness. I need your power. I need your wisdom. I need that reminder that it is not about me but it is about you for me and you for the world. Christ Jesus energizes you. Christ Jesus commissions you. Christ Jesus holds out hope to you. Christ Jesus takes you and me, all y'all, who once were enemies of God and with that big brush stroke of redemption, reconciles us and makes us his friends, but better yet, he makes us his family. May God work mightily through his word as it's planted in our hearts and as it grows forth and bears fruit, fruit that will last. In Jesus' name, amen.